the cord on this computer. Beautiful. Welcome everybody to the 22nd of February, 2024 Hyperledger Supply Chain and Trade Finance Special Interest Group. Uh, today, as you see at the top here, we have Leanne Kemp, a veteran of all this blockchain and supply chain stuff. She's smiling there. <laughs> well, we'll, well, we'll get to that here. So uh, anyways, we have her, so we're very excited that she's joined us. Uh, thank you, whether you're listening currently, joined in presently, or whether you're listening to on YouTube, which is where most people uh, tend to listen to or watch our uh, sessions here. Uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, all are welcome as is part of Hyperledger uh, overall thoughts. So we're glad glad that everyone from around the world is here, different thoughts, uh, different ideas. In addition, in the trust policy, don't say anything confidential here that you don't want to share with anybody else because this is an open forum, an open uh, group here, open source group. So uh, don't share anything confidential. So we got sessions here. Let me just go through real fast. Um, we have a number of open session or sessions here, upcoming events, uh, some hyperledger, some not. I will say, I was looking at our list. We are booked out until basically the end of May with sessions. So we got some, we found some good ones and people have come to us. So if you have some other ideas of things that you think are exciting, uh, please let us know and we can try to get that starting on the schedule in uh, June and July before, if you can believe it, we break for summer in August uh, with that. So anything else? Oh, I know what I wanna talk about here, projects. So I'll put this website, I put this link in the uh, um, chat once we get rock and rolling here. Uh, we're still nailing down what our project's going to be. Last year, we spent it on creating an ebook with act actual solutions out there that have numeric benefit and publicly available stuff. There's a lot of other good solutions out there also. So we're trying to figure out, okay, what are we going to work on besides doing webinars here in 2024? If you look at this, when you look at this website, you'll see a top six. I think it's six. One, two, three, four, five. Six, I can count. So uh, please go in and share your comments uh, with which one, which one of these you think are valuable, most valuable, and something that you think would uh, you may be able to willing to work on also. So with that, Alicia, Jeff, anything else that I, I missed uh, here? And I, th I think you got everything. There's a lot of great project mm -hmm. options if people can weigh in on that. And of course, our next. Our next meeting, we're going to be hearing from Jeff. He's going to give us a little bit of a technical overview. There you go. Well, supply chain digital twin. Good deal. Okay, so we're looking forward to it. And Ned, I, I seen here's here's with the comments section in the bottom. I net I saw that you just posted something here recently here. So recently, as in like in the last half an hour, 45 minutes. So thank you for that. So I'm going to stop share here. And now Leanne. We're going to let you bring up your charts, come off of mute. And while we're doing this, um, as I said at the top of uh, the session here, we're very happy to have Leanne Kemp. As I mentioned, she's a veteran. She's seen the ups and downs, both, I'm sure, personally, as well as uh, along with Everledger here. Because I, I think I remember I got involved in 2017 in blockchain stuff. And I think you guys were around even then. Uh, Leanne, in 2017. If not then, it was 2018, maybe even earlier. So uh, she's seen a lot. And where she's going to spend her time today is talking a little bit about, okay, what, what's happening in financial visibility? Because it, as you know, we have trade finance and supply chain, and those two come together here. And I, she has some uh, interesting thoughts around what's happened with the G7, et cetera, et cetera. So with that, She's in here, she's talking to us from India. Everything's gonna work so smoothly. I'll let you share now, Leanne, take it over from here. If you wanna say anything else more about yourself as well as Everledger, and then uh, we're off to the races. Yeah, thanks. Thanks everyone. Um, so hi, my name's Leanne Kemp. I'm the founder and CEO of Everledger. And I think you're right, definitely pre-2018, pre-2017. In fact, this crazy idea of Everledger came about in 2014. So 
um, I guess there are certainly a lot of provenance driven supply chain traceability companies today, but in 2014, when the vision came to light for me, where we began to decouple the sort of ledger from the cryptocurrency and decided to put this into um, the world of transparency, it was a pretty early fledgling idea, but I also knew that there was a pretty big problem to solve and specifically in the diamond industry. Um, and so parts of our vision hold incredibly strong today as it did in 2014. In fact, if anything, the problem space has come even closer towards us with the rise of the recent sanctions and OFAC. Um, and then of course, some of the concerns in financing in the diamond industry. Uh, and then on the backdrop of that, we still face the heightened concerns of um, uh, lab grown diamonds, uh, uh, fraudulent certification in the, in the programs and in the systems. Um, and of course, we're here to answer all of those concerns of industry. So the entire purpose of Everledger sort of holds strong, as I said, our vision was to contribute um, greater transparency, trust and sustainability, as well as try and couple this with an amazing consumer experience for marketplaces where provenance matters most. And that vision holds strong in the diamond industry. But of course, so too uh, does it hold strong in many other industries. And as we see today in the textiles traceability space or the backdrop of circularity, where we're not just only thinking about where does something come from, we're also now applying provenance to where something might go to, you know, the future of waste. We're looking at uh, in the mining industry, how do you repurpose um, tailings or tailings dams or waste into new value streams and provenance and traceability is at the core of all of those actions. So I just want to play just a 60 second video here that kind of frames and still stays true to exactly what we do. Uh, and hopefully the sound's going to work. Yes. And how do you turn that good story into good business? Welcome to the Everledger platform. Using blockchain and IoT technology, we shine a light on all the unique steps that make your product, your product its origins, its journey, the reasons to love it. Everledger helps everyone to trust what they buy. Our secure platform unboxes the lifetime story of any product, from diamonds to clothes to wine bottles and electric vehicle batteries, natural sales, and protect your brand against counterfeiting. You can generate new demand, like minded suppliers and buyers, showcase your sustainability record, and make claims with backed up evidence about the reasons to love your product, and invite partners and customers to tap into your world. Fully customizable, secure by blockchain technology and faster than ever. Make transparency a good story for your business with the Everledger platform. Let me flip back to the page. Sorry. Ah. It doesn't work when you want it to. That's a live demonstration, of course. <laughs> That's all right. Every object. Oh, my goodness. Itself. Come on. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So building trust across this supply chain, I think, is critically important. And as we focused um, on Everledger at the heart of the diamond industry, the opportunities to be able to track items and verify their true identity along that supply chain stays true in the enablement of provenance in grading report validation, um, digital transformation of those reports, and then consumer engagement so the conversation today is really focused in that one key um, market segment being the diamond industry itself um, and the applications that are live and in market and have been now for pretty close to 10 years in fact um, is driven by the requirements around compliance origin legality human rights environmental performance and of course the diamond industry points to a pretty characteristic history when we think about the Blood Diamond movie, Leonardo DiCaprio, the more recent rising of uh, the Russia sanctions and Ukraine war. Um, and so these things are still in the front mind of many consumers, um, both millennials of today and consumers of the past. Um, the authenticity and authentication is brought about through digital identities. Uh, we've seen the rise and to some extent, the fall of NFTs. Um, and a lot of those applications sit true in our industry as well around supply chains, product claim and validation on post-customer engagement is critical. And then data insights where we're driving that asset level tracking queries across the supply chain itself. And to bring the simplicity of that forward, um, we often see uh, you know, naming conventions where we're needing an entity level passport. Um, 
moving into supply chains themselves and then material passports. Um, a lot of this vision statement that I'm showing you today holds true now in policy as sure. European Union has now published the requirements around digital product passports and arguably a digital product passport in 2014 was um, on the backdrop of people's uh, minds, but not necessary on the front of their tongues. And today we've seen it enshrined in policy in various different industries. I just want to take you through this journey before I dig deep into the world of finance. And I think arguably Everledger has provided for traceability now across multiple supply chains. Our deepest and strongest has been in the diamonds, gemstones and jewellery industry, where as it stands today, there are tens of millions of gemstones that have been on the platform and that are effectively tracked from the source right the way through to the retail market and beyond in first and second time enablement with consumer markets. Um, more recently in the last year, uh, we also launched with the largest retailer globally. They're pretty well known in the US market. The holding group is Signet. Um, Signet is five or $6 billion uh, in terms of revenue. So they're a significant market hold. Um, they utilize the backdrop of our technology to bring an entirely new collection to market. And that collection was called Origin. It not only provided for the traceability of the diamond, but it also went through the jewellery piece itself, digging into the depths of SDGs and evidencing things um, like renewable energy, the use of water, um, as also recycled metals. And the evidentiary set of all of that data is held on the Everledger platform. I'm going to try and flick across to the live URL. Uh, can you see the Ernst Jones logo in front of you? We can, yes. Yeah, okay, great. So this is a live website. So anyone who's keen and watching and they fancy a four and a half thousand pound diamond ring for their uh, for their loved one, then just click here. Um, you can run through, this is a pretty standard sort of e-commerce website and the ease of implementation of this type of data um, actually comes through quite simply in integration with um, buttons or as we call it widgets, which is just div tabs that sort of drop into the e-commerce environment. Um, you see that there are various different sort of finance options um, under which there are significant backdrops around smart contracts that will execute depending upon how the supply chain provisions and or provides for those goods under APRO services or consignment services. So not everything is a buy uh, now in terms of the supply chain. There is often some triggers in terms of how that is financed through not just only the supply chain in B2B, but in this instance, a B2C. Under the traits origin, it'll pop a window and every single piece of this data has evidentiary sets that are coming off the Everledger environment. And attemptedly, this sits at around 16 vendors. So to be able to enable the delivery of a very simple um, diamond ring with one diamond in it takes about 16 vendors across the supply chain. So that's just not your supplier. That's your supplier, supplier, and your supplier, 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 supplier across multiple parts of the world. This diamond is from Botswana, uh, where this is the exact rough image itself. So this isn't necessarily um, a, an image of just any diamond, it is the diamond that was mined on the 8th of the 2nd last year. It then went through a cutting and polishing facility with this laser, um, this laser cut machine on the 21st of the 3rd. And then as it's then progressed itself across to the jewelry piece, it then, of course, has run through that process to ultimately provide for the ring that is now for sale in the store. If I go back to the presentation, hopefully this will flick across. Um, where we stand today in the market is enabling this information at a depth to start thinking about the requirements of industry as it looks towards greater transparency on the backdrop of what is happening with the G7 sanctions. Um, to enable a diamond traceability story isn't just tracking pieces of paper, it's tracking rocks that come out of the ground. And as you can see, a rough diamond itself has been effectively extracted at about 13.47 carats. Um, it will then go through what we call a mapping process with high vision creativity machines that enables us to do what we call an inclusion plotting and think of inclusions as faults and every diamond has a fault. And as you go through this process and program of works, um, 
we're able to capture the fingerprinting of those inclusions, which helps us to be able to effectively provide for some level of identity um, of the diamond. But also, as you can imagine, a 13 carat stone is not necessarily just cut into one diamond. So there are actually a mother and child relationship between multiple stones that would come out of this diamond. So out of this 13.47 carat, there were 364 inclusions or something that was wrong with it. Um, and out of that, two diamonds were cut. One was cut in five and one was cut in what we call 70 points. When people think about um, how do we enable traceability, it is at this level that is going to start changing the way industry first commands data and to tell better stories. But secondly, um, it will help to drive that enablement of finance as we um, are starting to see now as a requirement in industry. As that stone progresses through, and as I said before, it's looking at both of those two stones that have been the best cut at 6.72 and 101. And then there's the optimized options that are offered to the effective retailer or the customer itself. So as you can see, there are many permutations to both the planning of the diamond itself, but the ultimate end goal of that diamond. And as it's plotted through the back end, and this is kind of how the sausage is made, um, you start to see the photo reel, um, which is the photo reel of the end physical cut diamond, looks very different in its finished form than what it does in its rough form. And the plotting of all 3D interactive characteristics are also kept. And of course, the combination of all this data together enables us to be able to take a fingerprint level and enable that across the supply chain. So being able to connect the dots of the supply chain and go beyond storytelling is really where this starts. Um, and as we started to um, explain before, what we've seen in the market is the sanctions and the sanctions have started to come. Um, where OFAC created new Russia-related secondary sanctions, um, and there's an ex Leanne, an expand. Can you, can you on say the what band. OFAC is, just for some of the un uninitiated? Yeah, so um, OFAC is the official. I can't remember the exact name actually. OFAC. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> the Office of Foreign Asset Control. Yeah, the Office of Foreign Asset Control. Um, they are the effective overarching administrative body that decides um, for and on behalf of the US government and the coordinated uh, countries whether there has been a requirement to effectively ban the transport you know, the transportation of certain goods and or the financing of those goods and in the and in the positioning of Russia it's specifically related to um, the Ukraine Russian uh, war. Hey, and it does have some teeth. Uh, that same rule hung up a uh, Volkswagen. They were not able to import some cars recently to the United States because they had some uh, banned parts or subject to OFAC controls. So they had to sit on the dock. So so it had, so it's real. So go ahead, Leanne. Thanks. Yeah, very much so. And I think um, what we have seen is the increased sanctions that um, are kind of now sitting uh, at a level that will have some impact around the industry, some impact around finance. And certainly when we look at a system like Everledger that predominantly from the front end of our storytelling helps to enable retailers to tell a better story for consumers to bring confidence into the market. But what indeed sits behind the back end is everything you're seeing on the screen here, the AML and KYC compliance, the money laundering and the know your customer repositories origin and provenance is a key indicator. The statement of warranties compliance, where this is a driven part of our industry around the Kimberley process, where there is a statement of warranties around the rough being traded across borders. Um, the transaction level on business logic, supply chain traceability, and then running through into the back end around how can we enable um, clearing accounts, uh, not just only of stock, but also integration into the, into the SWIFT network and environment. To understand the positioning of the OFAC sanctions and the power that it holds specifically around Russia, um, G7 countries came together with the EU commission to make a decision and the executive order was issued by the Biden administration on the 22nd of December last year. Um, in some respects, when Everledger began in 2014, we had a vision, not that there would be 
a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. But of course, we have had sanctions invoked across the diamond industry previously with other countries. And we knew it was just a matter of time that something else would come. And there was a lack of available um, systems that could do that connection. And certainly the industry is well pronounced when it comes to um, advanced machine vision technology or scanning technology, because ultimately the way they're able to yield the greatest response from a diamond is to ensure that that technology is applied. But that same technology and the same data that is used to extract the highest yield or highest value from a rough diamond is now being turned on its head as a way to enable the compliance registry to move forward. Russia is the number one global diamond producing country in the world um, and not many people sort of know that um, there's a co-state owned entity called Al Rosa um, and that is now being sanctioned including a number of oligarchs as well but given that Russia is the largest producer of rough diamonds in the world and that is now being sanctioned for the G7 countries um, predominantly those G7 countries represent the highest yield of consumer intake of diamonds, it's going to have a significant um, disruption or a significant departure of the supply chain. Botswana in Africa, uh, can Canada, Congo DRC, South Africa, Angola, Zimbabwe, Namibia, everyone is there. Uh, Australia used to rank quite highly, but of course um, our Argyle mine closed um, in and around uh, COVID period. So you can see it's very Africa-centric in terms of volume, with the exception of Canada. The G7 timelines itself, when we start to compare um, the positioning around the rise of the EU battery directive, the European Union brought a battery directive out, which stipulated the traceability of critical minerals. And I do remember on the backdrop of that work um, in 2016, when the very first meeting was held uh, in, at the World Economic Forum to imagine the Global Battery Alliance and that enshrined timeline around traceability um, has given us right the way through to 2027, if not 2030. But this industry is moving significantly fast and in some respects um, it's ready uh, to enable the ability to have um, the integration of traceability with an overarching OFAC sanction because the industry largely is consolidated it's also invested in traceability for the better part of the last 10 years. And arguably this ban on diamond exports kicked in formally on the 1st of January. At the end of next week, uh, 1st of March, there's then a ban on Russian diamonds that are polished in third countries, um, meaning that those diamonds that have been extracted from Russia, but have been shipped to India where 90% of the world's diamonds are cut and polished, cannot enter into a G7 country in the world. So they are now looking at how do they enable that on the 1st of March. And then as at the 1st of September, there's an expansion of that band to include both natural diamonds, lab-grown diamonds, jewellery and watches. So it's a pretty big hammer that is coming down upon industry. And I thought it was important to frame the background context of traceability because arguably this is going to have a significant impact not only on the diamond trade and the supply chain channels and the physical processing of goods, but arguably it's also going to help um, bring about um, greater transparency in the systems uh, level across the industry. There are well-pronounced, incredibly mature enterprise level traceability solutions. Everledger began in 2014 and we're probably the oldest in traceability, but the youngest in the in the industry by far, that disruptive startup that we are. GIA is the Gemological Institute of America and they grade and certify about 80% of the world's diamonds and they're, they're the preeminent um, force of good for the industry. And they did set the standards of what we know around grading, which is referred to quite simply as the four Cs, the color, the cut, the clarity. Um, SARI is the prominent provider of scanning technology that enables those manufacturers to be able to plan and how to cut. And then there's Tracer, which is a program of works that is owned and uh, was launched by De Beers. De Beers being uh, one of the larger producers of diamonds in the world and has uh, the Botswana uh, relationship held tightly. Across these platforms, as I said before, there's tens of millions, multi tens of millions of diamonds that would be uh, consolidated uh, across these platforms with maturity, all of which have been operating in the market 
we've been in the market since 2014 and the majority of these programs came about in around 2018. So there's quite a lot of maturity, unlike other industries that have had recent surges of digital product passports, for example, critical minerals or electric vehicle batteries. A number of those initiatives are still very young and embryonic, whereas we do see that there's a lot of maturity in this space. When it comes to the Russia sanctions, there's been a talk amongst the crowds that um, what is being introduced is a, is, a, is a product level protocol, not dissimilar to the SWIFT protocol for banking. Um, how do we enable a way upon which governments have the ability to harmonize um, and bring compliance across the product level? I always liken this to the KYC, the know your customer, or the anti-money laundering is now moving and being married with KYO, the know your object. And the harmonization and the enablement of that will give stronger and richer compliance. But the larger question that I've always had in my mind is, is there a moment in time where there's a SWIFT-like protocol or integrating the KYO, the know your object, the know your diamond um, principles into the actual SWIFT framework itself. And this could offer a really promising approach to enable transparency and accountability in transactions involving physical objects like diamonds. Um, coupling that with payments uh, for object level information and maintaining this immutable transaction record, stakeholders can certainly uphold the ethical standards, mitigate risks and foster sort of trust in the trading um, ecosystem. So what we're seeing is a really interesting position in the market because not only have we got traceability that arguably is now moving to 10 years of maturity with tens of millions of diamonds, we have the onset of the OFAC sanctions and uh, Russia being the largest uh, mining country in the world. Um, and what we're seeing on the backdrop of that are retailers um, consuming this data in a way to enable better storytelling. But on the backdrop of this, it's very common for diamond companies, whether they be in Antwerp or Belgium, to be refused bank accounts. And the issue with that is when, and this is an exact extraction from a bank that is financing the diamond industry, the costs when exercising high-risk activities, and you can see if you look down the screen, at the second last line are diamond dealers, where that is in... <laughs> In the, the mix of uh, next to professional football clubs is the problem of the highest risk activity where banks are not necessarily favorable towards, but it's about 30,000 um, euros uh, in terms of high risk activity. But the talk of the industry now is if it's traceable, it's bankable. That's effectively the call cry. And it's not necessarily been driven by finance, but arguably on the backdrop of the maturity of these solutions in market, the appetite for better storytelling and more transparency to help consumers on the backdrop of G7. And as we are introducing OFAC sanctions and governments are looking to reach out to traceability platforms to cross validate um, data around the provenance story. It is very clear that traceability is baked into the everyday of this industry. And how do we now, what is the motivation towards making it bankable? And the motivation comes about from the reduction of risk, which is very clear in this slide, um, as well as the concentrated efforts in some of the countries in the world. Beyond we, we, the uh, data that I just showed you before, which was uh, object level data. Hey, Leanne, um, the, yep. Just a quick question here. Two slides back, the SWIFT and know your object kind of story. That's something you're proposing is that you think this is the way to go. This isn't something that's going on right now. This is the way I took that. I just want to make sure I understood that. Uh, yeah. So I think this is the, this is the, the thought, uh, the thought bubble of the moment, right? It's okay. very clear uh, okay, what I've seen in some of the, in some of the public media announcements that uh, the G7 have collectively described um, the protocol related to the sanctions as a swift like protocol for an object level traceability. And, I, and I'm suggesting if there is a way to couple what we are already doing in the diamond industry with SWIFT or with another paralleled SWIFT-like protocol, what could that actually mean in the transformation um, of industry? Right, right. Okay, good. I, thank you. Now I understand what, what you're saying here. Um. So moving on, of course, we need to have transactional level data. So it's not necessarily just about the object. And when it do, does come to um, the diamond industry and specifically for 
trade documentations, there are a number of different identification documents that are important and that are cross-checked um, geographically, material of origin, chain of custody, um, whether it's a receiving party, an invoice date, et cetera, et cetera. And a number of these layers of information are then coupled with the physical object data itself. Um, there is already an overarching um, industry body that enables the issuance of level of membership and certification that is running across different types of audits. And the combination of these together is enabling a more confident marketplace upon which new finances are coming into the space, into industry, um, as well as this contemplation event around can we couple KYO data with the SWIFT protocol and what would that then potentially mean to stronger sanctions that would cover follow the money and follow the diamond. When we do think about um, a chain of custody event across the supply chain, uh, many diamonds are certified or graded but that doesn't invoke um, a definition of chain of custody. So you cannot have a traceability system without some element of a chain of custody event handling. And when we think about the simplicity of this slide, of course, it's a lot more complicated than this, but there's effectively five grades um, of chain of custody event handling. If it's a grading report or a certification report and just an invoice, that is still not sufficient enough to be able to say that there's a chain of custody event but to enable an invoice with parcels and lots and gradings where there are multiple parties at, re at play, then it moves to partial. So anything beyond um, level grade one to grade three, if it's traceable, it's bankable. And this is parts of the definitions of industry that are starting to move towards having a more transparent supply chain to give confidence to consumers and a more invoked supply chain so that we can enable that if it's traceable, it's bankable, um, catch cry. <laughs> So integrating with financial accountability, um, we definitely see that with the rise of the OFAC sanctions, um, there is going to be stricter due diligence in the diamond transaction flow and stricter due diligence in the physical object itself. So we will see not just only industry and governments transitioning from KYC, the know your customer, but also to KYC and KYO coupled together. Um, the integration of financial data across the supply chain into um, platforms like Everledger is starting to become um, an attractive proposition. Multiple traceability platforms will have to transform themselves um, beyond just where what is the origin of the stone with mass financial integration. Automated compliance mechanisms, innovation in financial products will come and the convergence for a more sustainable and ethical diamond trade is finally here. So I think I can get to my nursing home and look back upon history and be proud of what we did in that short period of time. Uh, I'm trying to get to the next slide, but I think I'm either frozen or done. Sorry, something. Yeah, I think I'll see if I'm done, but I think that was the end of it. Okay. Oh no, it's frozen. <laughs> That's okay. It's frozen. <laughs> Didn't feel like quite the end, but uh, yeah, yeah, I've lost the, I've lost the connection. Okay. Are there any you're, questions? You're, Anything we need to talk through? You're still, you're still talking with us, so that that's good. So um, we can go and uh, I have two or three questions here. Um, I guess maybe. The first one here, if you could talk a little bit about the ups and downs of Everledger and what you've seen. Um, I thought you guys were dead to the world. I'll call it out here, and I'm glad you're not. So, you know, maybe if you could say, hey, here's why this is good, right? Um, that, that will help a little bit. Um, and then after that, if you could explain maybe a little bit about why Hyperledger, since we're a Hyperledger group, you know, why you're using that. And then I have one more question about chain of custody. Yeah, sure. So um, maybe I'll start with the Hyperledger question. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we sat on the Hyperledger framework since day one. Um, and I think there's been a lot of ups and downs in industry about is it private permission? Is it public permissionless and NFTs and ICOs and all sorts of three letter words came flying at everyone across the space. We maintained a pretty rigid view on the world, and that is that within supply chains, we're handling some of the most trade sensitive information that anyone could entrust us with, um, and that that needs to be um, carefully managed and, and carefully maintained. And, and um, for us, the environment upon which we chose, particularly with an industry like the diamond industry, 
when arguably the real world system, whether it's the Kimberley process where 81 countries come together, whether it's the positioning of certification, is really already human system is driven by a federated consensus, right? There is a consensus, human consensus mechanism that in this industry works with clarity and has stood the test of time in an industry as old as, oh, I shouldn't say it, but as old as prostitution, right? I mean, probably not put that on the, uh, on the Twitter. I've never thing. heard that analogy used, Leanne. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so when you start to sort of look at a human system that works, um, why disrupt it with a protocol that arguably is not going to appreciate the sensitivities and the values of an industry? So that's the first thing. The second thing is to really enable the onboarding with such veracity as we did. You cannot solve for provenance alone with just a blockchain. It has to come together with a symphony of technologies. So Everledger, as you saw, so clearly we have machine vision capability, AI capability. There's a lot of below the watermarks um, uh, technology that's combined to give us that fingerprinting or that instantiation of data. And the combination of that is incredibly suitable to the environment with um, with with Hyperledger, because we can actually drive an enterprise technology stack, um, and we're not sort of held at ransom to tokenization values and what's happening in the crypto bro space and the ups and downs. Our entire industry is reliant upon us to bring stability. <laughs> Um, we had a hiccup last year. I'll go into that next. But arguably, up until that one point in time, um, we were pretty much an silent assassin in terms of how we approached the problem space and 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 brought stability to that part of the market. When we um, look towards what's happening next, I think. Sorry, I'm in India. Um, it's very clear that governments are not going to entrust cross border control mechanisms cross-border data, importation documents to a permissionless public ledger. It's just clearly not going to come through. So an environment that does provide for federated consensus that sits in a private permissioned ledger is the enterprise choice of not just only governments, but also the enterprise choice of industries like the diamond industry. Um, from an Everledger perspective, I mean, I speak to the heart of what's happened. I started this business with a very clear vision for what I, the problem was that we wanted to contribute to solving. I mean, we didn't, we haven't solved the problem, but we're contributing to the solution. Um, and as a part of that journey, I guess I'm a veteran, not just only in the blockchain space, but a veteran as well. I'm over 50. So it's not my first rodeo. And I've certainly started companies before and exited and seen the full color of the day. Um, Everledger attracted some pretty impressive investors in its early stage and the, and the heights of that ran its course in time and arguably um, it stood it stood strong and continues to stand strong. Um, at the time upon which we had to restructure the entity, it, did, it certainly wasn't completely liquidated. We had to restructure the entity in an aggressive manner. It was off the backdrop of um, quite a concerning... Um, concerning a transaction event with an investor that wasn't staying strong to a contract that was bounded. Um, and as a part of that, there was a decision to be made that we couldn't we couldn't see eye to eye on the future pathway. Given that I held the commanding um, shares, uh, still the largest shareholder of the company after the significance of raises that we had and controlled the board, it was a decision that was made to run the company through uh, a administration event that ended up looking at a liquidation event into two of the entities and then now we've persisted forward. Um, I own Everledger 100% outright and that is now well behind us and the team has persisted through and customers have stayed and it was a moment in time that believe me I had to look in the mirror and say is this a vanity project? Um, am I doing this because I'm egotistically connected to my keyboard or there's something here but the reality is it was the customers that called and it was the key staff that, you know, kept this thing moving forward. And uh, it was interesting at the time because a number of calls came through and said, oh, no, not you, not Everledger. Like if there's ones to go, it shouldn't be what you're doing. So, uh, yeah, that we saw the light of day and now it's in the it's in the rear vision mirror for us, which is nice. Good, good. Thank, thank you for uh, sharing. And it could be a that. Harvard case study of how to go through a up and down with a bad investor. <laughs> I, I can understand. I can understand that. Hopefully there'll be big time stars here coming forward. Um, any other questions out there before I go into uh, my 
uh, other question. Yeah, I just have a, a couple of tech questions, tech related questions. Um, so, so Leanne, on the fingerprinting, use diamonds. Sounds like you're using some new AI vision tools to fingerprint a diamond. I guess my question is, how do you, on the traceability, how do you, um, what's your basis for tracing a diamond? So if, it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're taking, what is those things called, inclusions? That you're taking a, an image of the diamond and you're recording the inclusions. And I assume that's AI doing that. And then you're, are you creating an NFT then? on that diamond to track it through all the way through its cutting so that you can do that traceability from what's in the store all the way up to what was mined? Yeah, look, we've been really fortunate in the diamond industry because a lot of the technology that has been used, whether it's spectrography readings or what have you, is well-pronounced technology and has been here for quite some time. And also diamonds are laser inscribed. So there's a microscopic laser inscription on the girdle or the crown of the stone. And again, that technology had been in industry for quite some time as well. And it's the combination of those machines that are currently doing the scanning. As I said before, those machines have been connected for the pure purpose of manufacturers extracting the best economic yield from the cut of the diamond. Um, but no one had necessarily seen the use of that data as a way to connect the supply chain together. Um, and yes, there is forms upon which I wouldn't call it AI, it's machine vision as far as I'm concerned, which is a discipline, I guess, of course, of artificial intelligence um, that is used to map and to identify Cartesianal coordinates and a number of different disciplines around how we can get that sort of fingerprinting together. That's not the only technology that's used. So there is DNA immersive liquids that are used in the emeralds traceability supply chain because emeralds are a softer gemstone than a diamond. So you can't really immerse a diamond um, in a DNA liquid and do that traceability, but you can do the same for um, an emerald or a ruby or a sapphire. Um, and, and geographically, we're able to gemologically tell where a ruby comes from or an emerald comes from where it's very difficult gemologically to tell if it if this diamond came from this particular kimberlite seen in russia or in australia so there's different ways across the supply chain that we use how we forensically identify the the object itself so it's not a here's one algo algorithm and it solves all problems across all gemstones and the same too with pearls i mean the ability to provide identification of pearls. Um, they're using hyperspectral and multispectral cameras to do an identification of a pearl, which of course then has machine vision algorithms that sit over the top of that. So, so those data that you're, you talk about, are those, how are those put into Everledger, the actual data? Is it an NFT then that you, you can hook together yes, I'm with sorry, the other the, pieces? Yeah, the question it, you asked. So, um, and I was there's sure been if you were allowed to tell what that is underneath or not. <laughs> no, 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 no. I just NFT forgot that that was a part of your question. <laughs> That's okay. No, I forgot it was a part of your question. So yeah, the um, the data is effectively pushed together through a composable NFT that's privatized. Okay. So it's not something that we list up on OpenSea and you buy a diamond and what have you. Um, that's not necessarily our approach. And I don't think it will ever be our approach. We're not here to sell diamonds or a virtual diamond. That's not the point of us. The point of us is a heavy compliance mechanism in the back end. Um, we did deploy in the Emerald space with gem fields and provenance proof, which is one of our sister companies that runs on our tech stack um, for um, the rhinoceros, uh, National Rhinoceros, Save the Rhinoceros Day, a series of NFTs that were auctioned off um, called Chimbali. Uh, and that was used as a charitable gooding, uh, oh, charitable okay. giving exercise. Um, I think on or around COVID, you know, when everyone was excited about NFTs and and Pepe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, thanks. Hi, Leanne. I remember back in around 2017, 18, you launched the Chai Wine Vault. I haven't seen anything recently around Everledger and food and beverage traceability. Are you still working in that space or more? focused on diamond, battery, et cetera. Yeah, so the breakout for us in that space was we had a patent on the back end, we still hold it in mm -hmm. our rolling code sequence for anti-tamper proof RFID. So my background's been in 30 years in RFID technology and NFC technology. So my attenuation background kicked in. Um, 
So that deployment in the Chai Wine Vol with the Tampa proofing went across into Napa Valley and then also actually into short batch gins and spirits. Um, the yeah. same technology was then deployed into the swing tags and the embedded tags in Alexander McQueen, which is textiles. So it was less for us at that stage around the industry um, deployment to, uh -huh. to say we're going to do wine traceability. It was actually more in situ of the of the intelligent labelling was really the point of that exercise. So that intelligent labelling resides in um, packaging inside of diamonds. Uh, mm -hmm. So the packaging that goes out to consumers as well as the secured packaging in the diamond supply chain in the B2B context, in textiles and in um, spirits and wine. So it's a, it's actually, it's a, it's a piece of hardware. It was so exciting to read about it at the time. And it's great to hear how that's, that adaptation has gone across to a bunch of different industries. Thank you. Okay, Christos, Anupa, Ned, anything? No, it was a great presentation. Okay, good. Uh, I got, uh, Leanne, a couple more questions for you. Uh, one, getting back to uh, the chain of custody, where's, where's the biggest challenge for you of certifying or authenticating the data that's coming into the systems or into the chain or whatever you want to call it? Um, so it sounds like there was a lot that's already there. And what we've seen with other projects is if there's already sensor data or sensors in place or IoT, whatever you want to call it, that tends to make it easier than to use blockchain and actually believe in the data. So it sounds like there's some of that. Where's, where's the biggest challenge within the diamond supply chain? Yeah. So I think it's the beauty about the diamond supply chain is it, it's a highly secured chain of custody in any event. You can't just put a diamond on a FedEx truck and hope that it gets, you know, catches up at the other end. It's not going to go in a bill of lading on the back of a boat next to a packet of lithium. It's in secured transport. And there's only really four major carriers in the world, Brinks, Malka, Amet, Ferrari, et cetera. So in that respect, that secured chain of custody event is not necessarily a challenge. Whereas in the textile space, it is, right? You're trying to work out ginning and spinning on the back of a bullet car in, you know, in Madagascar. There's no chance you'd know that. That's not the case here, right? There's secured vans, brinks, et cetera. So there's good handoff documentation at every part of that external part of the supply chain. The biggest issue to be really blunt with you is in um, refinery and metals traceability, because it doesn't matter if you have DNA tracer, if you've got machine vision capability, once you molten that thing down to a lava soup, there is nothing going to secure that or track that. So you've then got to have a true secured chain of custody event where you're trusting you're trusting in God all others cash to a certain extent, right? That that provider is doing the right thing. And there's no technology that persists through that at all, full stop. So that is the weakest link of any supply chain is when we're relying upon human interactivity. Yeah, well, that's definitely true. That was some of the early ones, right? Is there's a person with a clipboard and saying check, and then it got entered onto a blockchain later on. And clearly that wasn't gonna work at all. Not gonna work. <laughs> Not gonna work. Um, coming back around my last question here on the, financial aspect of it what do you think needs to be done so you're proposing or thinking that there's some integration with swift or even some of their faster payment stuff that they're they're working on uh here what do you what, what do you think needs to be done or what could trade finance professionals uh do to help facilitate some of the br bridge between know your object and actually getting and you build lading and all that other fun stuff so that you can get financing and avoiding fraud. I mean, you know, 80% of this industry to a certain extent has some level of consignment goods where if you've got custody of the diamond, it's very different to owning it. It's very different to having financial rights to it. And the complexity of all that calls out for a perfect, you know, smart contracts domino effect layer where we have enough sufficient level of traceability data at an object level that can indeed trigger off these finance um, clauses and contracts and exchange of value. It's always been a vision that a lot of people in trade finance, particularly um, in the blockchain space, have vision, but you can't get there unless you've got true object level um, provenance. And even the motivation of industry to tell better storytelling for consumers 
is still not giving you the compliance level data. I can still tell a good story without having the complete inclusion mapping at the level. But if we're bringing in OFAC sanctions and G7, we're thinking about it from that perspective with more rigidity in finance, then it is actually quite a really fast moving and exciting time for industry to think about what happens next. Um, I think at the moment, you can't necessarily just run trade finance without looking at the overarch of insurance, right? And so I think that has got to become coupled with any innovation in the space. And so the que I can't answer you, but I can leave you with a question. And that is, it's got to be coupled with how do you think about that insurance overlay with trade finance? And there's something special in the secret of the source with that. When you get to the table and have those two parties come together with KYO, then you start to see something really interesting that turns the tide. No, that's a good thought. And I mean, you can go back and look through some of our projects. We're trying to get to that level of something. Here's where there could be value for the entire community of supply chain, logistics, trade finance professionals out there. And if it can help to set some sort of vision or method to get there, then, we, then we've done something valuable for the community there. So good on that. Anything else from anybody else before we wrap up? Okay, I'm seeing shaking heads. I saw Noop, he was in from India. Since he wasn't a presenter, he was able to <laughs> leave a little bit earlier. <laughs> We're glad that he joined. So for those of you uh, watching on YouTube, thanks for joining here. Listen until the end. Please take a look at um, the project list and add your comments. Leanne, thank you very much for sharing uh, both where you are right now as well as what happened in the past and how that kind of goes. And so sounds like you got a lot of fun things that can happen in the future here. And we're glad that you were able to uh, share those with us here today. So thanks for that, everyone. Our next session is, when are we, Jeff? The 8th? 8th of March? Uh, I think it's the 7th. 7th. March. 7th of March. Okay. Same, same time, same bat channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeff will be sharing his little demo that he's put together using Hyperledger Fabric and NFTs and digital twins. So look forward to that. And with that, enjoy the rest of your day or enjoy your evening if you're Leanne. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. See ya. See ya.